big companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook are doing great work. They provide great services for us. Um, but at the same time, I think they could be uh, creating more jobs in Canada and investing more, more here. I don't think they should go unchecked. Uh, I, I think it's really important that they're held accountable for their actions, but not they shouldn't be treated differently from any other company. I think big tech companies, if Canadians are using them in their life, um, and we do, we are very big on using Facebook and Amazon and Google daily, um, we're some of their biggest supporters. So they should create employment opportunities here and pay Canadian taxes following suit. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And I, I actually had a rule in life that I'd managed to keep up until this point, which is never follow Amanda Lang on anything. Uh, so thank you, PPF, for, for, uh, for ruining that for me. Um, the goal, the, the, the title of this session is called The Rise of Digital Nationalism in an Era of Big Tech. And that has some dark connotations to it. So I thought before going into my natural journalistic cynicism, uh, I would first invite the panelists up and uh, ask them to tell us what they're actually excited about uh, in this era that comes with the wonderful technologies that we've all been given. So let me introduce them, and uh, one at a time, they'll come up, give a little statement, and then we will sit down in these wonderful comfy chairs and have a conversation. First up, uh, a man who actually doesn't need an introduction, at least in some communities, certainly mine, is Joshua Bengio. Uh, he's authored three books and over 500 publications pertaining to digital, to deep learning. Uh, full professor, Department of Computer Science at the University of Montreal, holds a Canada Research Chair, uh, and is an officer of the Order of Canada. Uh, he's also a recent recipient of the Turing Award for Conceptual and Engineering Breakthroughs. And I should point out, for those of you who don't know, the Turing Award is effectively the Nobel Prize uh, for his craft. So please welcome to the stage, Yeshua Bengio. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming. So, there's lots of scary stuff we can talk about, but first, what excites you when you go to work every day and you, you look at these technologies that you're dealing with? Um, what gives you hope and optimism about where we're going? Well, um, I believe that if we do the right things collectively, we can really use these advances in technology for good in many ways. At the same time, I think it's important not to have rosy glasses and, and look at both the concerns and uh, the good things uh, with the same objectivity. And be prepared because some of the impacts of technology are gonna be with us for decades. And sometimes things like changing our education system or our social safety net, it may be things we need to do now and prepare for years because it takes time. So I'm excited because we are at such an important time in taking those decisions and at the same time, I feel like we have a special responsibility because of that. And certainly Canada plays a role in that, having that special responsibility. Thank you. Please take a seat. Our next uh, guest uh, or panelist is Janet De Silva. Uh, Janet is president and CEO of the Toronto Region Board of Trade. In this role, she represents the interests of 12,000 members and 20,000, 200,000 businesses across the Toronto region. Prior to this role, uh, Janet served as the dean of Ivy Asia, leading the Hong Kong campus and mainland China operations of the Ivy Business School. Okay, so from, from Hong Kong to Toronto, you've come back here. Yeah. Uh, it's been a few years now since you've few been years, back. Yeah, four years. Four, four years. Winters. Um, <laughs> what, <laughs> optimism, optimism. Uh, yeah, I know, it's spring. Um, <laughs> what excites you about where we're going? You know, uh, what excites me is, our mayor keeps saying it, Toronto's having a moment. But what excites me is this moment could actually be momentum for us. We've got so much going on in our business community, both in domestic tech and with some of the um, big tech from outside that have come in that are just fostering a lot of potential for our economy. That's what excites me, our ability to take advantage of this and, and move forward for the country. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks. Please take a seat. Take a seat. Uh, up next, last but not least, James Hinton. Uh, James is the, own, is the founder of Own Innovation, where he's a strong supporter of Canadian technology companies. He's also a fellow at the, fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation, where his research interests are IP strategy and innovation policy, something that we've certainly spoken a lot about already today and we'll get into here. Yes, thank you. Um, James, Jim, I, I keep having this thing. Uh, what excites you about? where we're going. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm hearing today is a lot of stuff that we've been discussing in a lot of detail over the last three and a half, four years. 
And so Minister Baines has been a, a great advocate uh, for the national IP strategy that was launched a couple years ago and, and things like the patent collective being rolled out. These are things that are um, unprecedented in the Canadian um, IP landscape. This is, the, this is something that we haven't, uh, we've, we've never really thought of IP as an economic driver. Um, it's been left to the lawyers of a, uh, too often. And so um, finally getting this public discourse around the importance of the intangible assets, innovation, or um, uh, IP data, um, and the talent that creates it, I think is, uh, is, is, is fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you very much, everybody. So to start, uh, because we spoke about digital nationalism in the title of this panel, I thought it was important to start with some uh, geopolitical uh, questions, because I, I don't know if we can have this discussion around Canada's role without understanding where we are across the globe. Um, you have China, you have the United States, you have the, the EU, uh, with or without the United Kingdom, uh, and all three have taken very different tacks when it comes to how they deal with big tech, with digital nationalism. Uh, what role do you see Canada playing in there? If we were to pick uh, a, a, a cart to stick, a, a, a horse to put our cart on, who should we pick? And I'll start with you, Janet. Um, I think we should pick the carts where we have formed trade agreements. So CETA and TPP, that's not China, that's other parts of Asia. Because as a mid-size um, country, we're going to need to work with some other partners of the same size to get a harmonized set of practical operating guidelines for us to operate in tech. Our big focus on tech is really how do we move from being amazing at this research to commercializing and market. There's a lot of things like regulations, operating frameworks, infrastructure that are going to be required, and it's not we're not a big enough economy to develop that ourselves. We need to work with partners, and I'd be pivoting to those folks that we've trusted with trade relationships. Yashua, you know, you, you, you've probably traveled the globe talking about these issues. Who do you trust? Well, uh, I believe we're entering an era where it's really important to have global coordination on many fronts, and technology is one of them. So I think um, we should take advantage of Canada's uh, past leadership in, in helping this sort of global coordination and multilateral agreements where small countries like ours, I think, are uh, gonna have the best possible position to both uh, influence global decisions and, um, and also play a, a, a leadership role. And in the case of AI, I think we, we have scientific leadership. We are trying to also push forward with uh, the, the uh, AI economy uh, we also need to have moral leadership uh, to, to make sure that the technology is used for uh, good for most people. And um, I was sitting in a couple of um, G7 related meetings uh, about AI and what I found is actually a lot of consensus um, on, from six of the seven countries about this issue and the idea that governments, need to prepare to make sure uh, that AI is, is, is used in interest of society in general. Uh, otherwise, we run the, run the risk of seeing people reject technology and reject progress. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's the right decision, but uh, it, it means being a bit more assertive, I think, that Canada has been in the last few years on the international scene. Jim, you know, we, we, Minister Baines was here a, a few minutes ago. Um, how do you do this in a world where China is spending $500 billion on their AI research and, and you know, Element AI, the company that Joshua works for, is, is just a drop in the bucket relative to that? Yeah, so if you think of Canada's position and where we are now when it comes to AI, as the, as the logic pointed out uh, last fall, in the last three years on AI um, innovation capture, we've been the only country to have less IP uh, uh, filed. And so we're, we're in, a, in this sort of global war to own the AI landscape, um, the Americans and the Chinese, and we're, we're a very small player. So if we want the outcomes mm -hmm. to be able to control um, how it's used and, uh, and, the, and the benefits, we need to stop going backwards. And so these, this, is this, this, this decrease in owning AI technology is despite throwing um, 
$125 million and $250 million of, of public money. Um, and so we need to start capturing some of the economic benefit of this to be able to control it. Is that true, Joshua? I, you know, I, I, well, I mean, it, it's those statistics that we reported are true because it was in the logic and you should, all, you should all know that by subscribing. Um, but is, you know, I, I have a lot of conversations with, with, with startups, with venture capitalists, with members of the community who say, look, IP, sure, it's important, but we're building business model innovations. We don't need intellectual property innovation. Um, as someone who produces a lot of IP, not necessarily a lot of it in this country, how important is it for Canada to, to retain its own IP? So I think there are more important issues. I think the investment issue, the, um, the type of investments that Canadian um, companies um, and pension funds and so on are um, willing to make right now is not what is needed by the tech industry. Um, the, the investment style in the Silicon Valley is uh, looking much more forward uh, in the future, um, being able to take risks, being able to uh, think about very fast growth for companies that are going to uh, be global. Um, I think the IP issue is a, a, an important card to play to protect our companies against attacks. Um, but it's not going to be sufficient, right? It's a defensive move. It's good. But we need to make sure we invest properly in our companies. And, and the kind of investment that tech needs is very different from what other sectors typically uh, require. And, and we don't have the culture, the, the mentality in our businesses, in our financial institutions, in our um, uh, even the local VCs don't, don't have the kind of thinking that you, you find in some places in the US or even in China. I, I'm not sure how to change that culture, but I think if we don't do it, all of these things, our, pro, our uh, leadership in science, um, our efforts on IP are gonna be useless. Just, just to pick up on that point, I'm curious, uh, what, you, what, what do we not do uh, here that they do in, in other parts of the world from a financing perspective? So we're doing a pretty good job in the early stages of um, uh, financing startups. There are lots of um, uh, VCs here that are doing reasonably well. There are uh, lots of um, nonprofit, uh, often government-funded uh, ways to um, uh, to mentor these companies, and that's good for the early stages. But when it you know, the time comes to invest more seriously, what happens is we turn to bigger pockets in, in, in the US or, or China or um, South Korea. And uh, at the end of the day, it's gonna be a transfer of property, whether it, you know, it is protected or not, it's gonna be a transfer of the future wealth that we could amass. And one reason why I'm interested in this question is I believe that Canada in fact, every other country, but but uh, but Canada in particular, should uh, make sure that we create that value in Canada that can be taxed in Canada with AI, so that we can deal with the transitions that are going to come and they're going to be costly for governments. For example, in, in, in the in the job market and and education, to to deal with automation and and, and things like that. Um, so it's really important that we do this right but I'm not sure we're doing the right moves yet. Uh, Janet, how do you feel about more taxation uh, on, on these companies too? It's uh, not more taxation on these companies in particular. It's, it's uh, I don't think we need to tax uh, AI companies in a different way. That would be a, a big mistake. They're gonna make a lot of money. The problem is that we need to make sure that the, um, the money that they're gonna make is gonna be uh, taxed in Canada, at least for the part that the you know, is, is, should really be taxed here. And we need to make sure that as many um, um, uh, main offices of these companies are actually here, that we have um, uh, an environment that will create more you know, large multinationals that can exploit AI. 
Okay, so um, I'm not a fan of taxes. Uh, I'm not a fan of winter, but let me talk to you about what I'm a fan about. I'm a fan of a lot of amazing innovation that's going on, uh, particularly in the Toronto Waterloo Corridor. Um, I am personally involved with 60 of our members that are involved in either urban tech or autonomous vehicles. And we've got some real problems. We've got real problems about not having operating and regulatory frameworks for them to develop proof of concept. We don't have enabling infrastructure. I mean, we're kind of years behind on getting 5G up and running. Uh, we don't have procurement pr practices that allow them to get access to market. And we're not thinking about the urban shape and form to enable things like urban tech and autonomous vehicles. So if I can give one example, we've got an autonomous vehicle working group. Here's what we want to solve for. How do we make Toronto the most attractive city in the world to deploy AVs? I've got nine CEOs sitting around the table. Two are from uh, US firms. The other seven are all domestic firms of all shapes and sizes. And our ability to work together, the two uh, US firms are Uber and GM, who are doing a lot of programming here in Toronto to enable AI. If they weren't at the table, this discussion would be moot. But it really is, in my mind, the big win here. I agree, IP is an important economic currency that we'll need to capture more of uh, in the new economy. But really, what it's going to take to get funding and to get capacity is to, uh, with some urgency, get a framework in place so that businesses can deploy that technology and market here. So policymakers in the room listening to this you know, take back what exactly for them? Well, I will tell you that by July, we will have a report that says, here's the matrix of what we need to be fixing in order to get AV deployed on scale here in Toronto. And some of it says low tech as the color of paint that we choose to use for um, lanes on our highways and roads to make sure it's easier for the sensors to absorb and how we keep uh, traffic signals and other things clear in harsh weather conditions to other things around 5G, getting sensors uh, enabled throughout and getting, uh, getting market access for our, for our vehicles. The IMF uh, just last week came out with its annual report and they said in chapter two, not chapter one, but chapter two, that big tech uh, was a real concern for them in increasing inequality and reducing competitiveness. Um, Jim, I'll start with you. Uh, how do you feel about the role that big tech plays uh, in, our, in our lives and in our, in our ecosystem, but also speaking about those larger things about what um, Minister Raitt said, or, or and Lisa Raitt said, uh, about how you know, populism is, is on the rise because of this income inequality. Yeah, so when it comes to um, large, the, the large tech firms, um, you think about what they're doing and, and when, they're here in, when they're here in Toronto, it's, uh, when, I, when I see it from the IP lens, it's an extractive measure. They're coming here to extract IP. They're coming here to extract um, data, and they're coming here to use talent for cheap. And so it's, um, if we see it, see it for where the economic flows are, um, it's, a, uh, it's a, a sort of a failure of innovation policy to continue to try to lure these, these companies in um, without economic benefit. Um, the, employ the employment um, revenue that you're getting is, is crumbs. We, we want to have the innovation billions. And so that means domestic companies being able to grow and scale. We don't need to invite their biggest and fiercest competitor, give them um, pennies on the dollar IP, give them um, uh, reduced, uh, reduced te uh, tech talent, uh, reduced cost tech talent, and we don't need to give them um, uh, shred credits to be able to develop IP. Each one of these, e each, each sort of segment of IP, each patent that they, these, these foreign tech companies are um, subsidized here by Canadian taxpayers to create is something that's going to limit the freedom to operate of the next uh, Canadian tech company. So I'll give a, a quick example. Um, uh, uh, two or three years ago, a nice patent was issued for, um, and Professor uh, uh, Benjio would, 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 would know well, but um, paid for by the, uh, in part by the, the Canadian taxpayer out of the University of Toronto, um, and, uh, and then it was acquired by, um, uh, acquired by Google. Any Canadian tech company that wants to come in and exploit AI, a AI technology globally is going to be hampered by this now Google-owned um, Google patent. You want to use neur neural networks in this way, um, you're going to have to uh, be, ho be beholden to Google. And so it's, a, it's an extractive measure, it's, it's not a good thing. Um, it's a, a net negative, a net loss, um, and so we can't, we can't continue to do this. 
Uh, Janet, I, I attended an event uh, last year when the CEO of Uber came to town at, at your beautiful office or wonderful layout of your, of your building. Um, you know, that was a big moment uh, mm -hmm. for Toronto, for a lot of people. Uh, do you, uh, what do you make of Jim's comments do, that these companies are extractive? I, um, look, I have a lot of respect for a lot of my, my colleagues throughout the ecosystem. I really worry that we've uh, turn the solution to one of let's pr be protectionist, we're too small a market. I go back to how do we get smarter about creating operating environments here. I fully agree. I think, and I've had some backgrounds with universities, I think we do a very poor job of how do we monetize the research here for our benefit. How do we put better deals in place so that if, the, if there's funding coming in from somebody else for some of these developments, that we're keeping skin in the game and keeping a piece of that IP. But the other piece that I'm very, very uh, concerned about is that we seem to think it's a zero-sum game. It's not only about a domestic set of innovators, it's about how do you have other parts of the global ecosystem participating here for the benefit of the whole. So that's that's how I would react. I'm, I, you know. so I've, I've, studied, I've studied the literature on this and the, the economic impacts um, and the studies that talk about the spillover effects, it makes sense in a man manufacturing tangible based economy. These papers come out of uh, the, the late uh, um, 1980s and so if we go to the, the, the Spear um, uh, Naslin report, um, at that point, the, the value of intangibles was maybe half. And so we're operating in a different space than, this, this, um, than what the economic thinking was at the time. And so we have to shift our, our policies around that. IP is in inherently negative. And so everything that you, you generate for somebody else is something that's going to limit the freedom to operate for somebody for, for the, the next Canadian company. And so it is, to a certain extent, either a negative one or a plus one but, um, and so you, we have to see it from that lens. Yashua, you, um, uh, you gave an interview to Axios in 2017 where you said that it was a winner-take-all world with these big tech companies and that, quote, governments have become so meek in front of companies. Um, do you still feel that way two years later? And again, lots of policy people in the room here. What would you say to them about uh, how we should be approaching this? Well, I think there is even more evidence that there is a uh, winner-take-all situation um, in, in different markets, of course. And this concentration of power issue is happening at a level, you know, among companies, and, but it's also happening at the level of countries. Um, it's happening also in a way uh, as different groups in the population will benefit from the changes due to technology and others will, will suffer. So, so there's e these inequalities are coming simply because AI is one technology which is powerful and will get even more powerful in the future. And when you have power, well, you tend to use it to get even more. It's just a natural thing. I'm not sure what the solutions are, but maybe we have to rethink some of the basic ways we think about our economy uh, as we move forward. And it, you know, these things take time. Um, and I, I don't offer solutions, but there are scholars, economists, and political scientists who are thinking uh, forward, and, and we should pay attention to, to these discussions. Um, I'd like to go back to the IP thing, though. Sure. So my experience as a researcher uh, who has been working with companies as well is that, at least in my field, patents are... Um, Patents are pretty much useless. And the reason is that it's very easy to, um, to do something else which uh, has the same spirit as what is in the patent because really the important ideas are not the kinds of things you can lay down in a patent. The important ideas are mathematical. And uh, fortunately, we can't patent math yet. Um, so, so those patents don't really play a role to protect uh, our companies. The patents are really used by larger companies to uh, scare smaller companies um, to prevent them from entering their turf. And that is a real concern. So I know small companies which uh, are struggling to fight uh, against the, the, the 
you know, really, really large multinationals that are dominating their area. And, uh, and it's, it's good to think about that. But you also need to understand that, um, say, what Google bought uh, wasn't worth anything except some sort of, uh, um, especially because Google has uh, uh, voiced their will to use patents only in a defensive way. So they're, they're, they're not the, the, the guys we should be concerned about. We should be concerned about other companies using patents in an in a, uh, aggressive way. Um, so so I, I think it's good that we, we build these defenses, but you, we should also understand that the real value uh, isn't there. It, the real value, uh, so it's, in other words, like if, for example, I buy a company or someone buys a company and gets the, the patents from that company, it's worth nothing. What's really worth something are the people who understand those patents and can develop uh, new products and services around them. So the patents are useful because we are in this environment, this sort of uh, war, legal wars that, that companies fight with each other. But, but really, it's, it's more like uh, scare tactics and how long can I stand against you in, in court. And so when it comes to, um, when it comes to IP, you can't just think of it as one, a patent. It's the, it's the data, it's the training data, it's the algorithm, it's the, it's the whole cloud of rights that come it's around. The it. It's, it, it's, that, it's the really talent, actually, that really is worth a lot. And that yeah. is actually the one thing that, uh, say, American companies or other foreign companies are coming to Canada to get is the talent. Um, everything else is secondary to that. Um, and I think we should orient our policies to create a lot more talent, to make sure we retain our talent, um, and to give that talent opportunities to create companies here in Canada and, and join Canadian companies and have the incentives for that. Janet, is there I enough fully, talent? I, no, I, I fully, fully agree with what you're saying. And again, I go back to our huge focus right now is how do we move to an environment for commercialization in Canada? We do a lot of work uh, with our tech companies in the community. We've got health, innov health tech innovators that are not developing anything for Canada. There's no market here for them. So they're working really hard on products and services for the US and for Europe. And if we're worried about losing talent, when they start getting those contracts elsewhere, that's where they're gonna relocate their businesses. We have a trade accelerator program through our World Trade Center Toronto that helps companies develop export strategies. We help them go to market. There's a specialized version of TAP, this trade accelerator for the tech sector. Many of our tech companies, their very first contracts are from other markets. And once they're doing that, it's not long thereafter that the business is starting to reorient itself out of our market. So I, I come back to, some very valid concerns about patents and IP, but it really is how do we start getting out of our own way in terms of operating regulatory frameworks, in terms of enabling infrastructure, in terms of procurement, so that we can start deploying in market. There here. was, um, when Amazon HQ2 was still in the running um, in Toronto, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, hand wringing around the idea of Amazon soaking up the talent that we speak about with such value. Um, so how do these two things reconcile themselves? Well, you know, it, it depends. There's not, it depends who you talk to in the space. I do have tech entrepreneurs that are saying the good news is the Global Talent Visa now is enabling them to get really good talent in as well. And with any major, I mean, any of my companies, it doesn't matter what sector they're in, everyone's in a war for talent. There's more demand for people than there are available operators to do it. So I wouldn't point to it's because Amazon or Google is here that this is a problem. I would argue that Amazon and and Google investing in really cool stuff here is a draw for other people to want to come in. It also will spin off over time more of our own innovators to be able to create things here. But I keep coming back to, I think, what's being lost in all the noise about big bad tech is what are we doing here to help commercialize here so that we're growing the businesses here first. So to, along those lines, the national data strategy is something that is you know, still probably going to be rolled out. We had hints today from, from the minister that it's coming soon. Um, uh, what, uh, what are you hoping to see in that? I am policy? just hoping to see a bit more fire in the belly to get this done sooner. I, I feel like we're spending way too much time 
wringing our hands and talking about things as opposed to getting some really smart people in a room and say, how do we fix this? I was just, I'm part of Asia Pacific's Foundation, Asian Business uh, Leaders Advisory Council. I know Goldie is here as well, he's part of that. We were just in Hong Kong. Half that council are CEOs running businesses in Asia and we were asking all the same questions. What are you doing to get your markets ready to operationalize in market all the innovation that's going on? Everyone's at kind of the same stage with the exception of China. And uh, that's for a different set of reasons. So I go back to we've really got to get our heads in the game and move quickly. It's not just a Canadian strategy. It's got to be a Canadian strategy that gives us scale. And that's where I come back to looking at trade agreements with Europe and with TPP countries to figure out what we can do as a collective to really uh, control our, our future. But again, a ton of what we need to be talking about is, is how do we solve for commercialization here. Yeah, so I think it, it, the data strategy is, is long overdue. Uh, this, this discussion around data has been going back a number of years, and we've really, we really missed the boat when it came to things like uh, NAFTA 2.0. Um, we, 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 it was a, an, entire, an entire failure from the digital policy perspective. Um, it doesn't help Canadian companies grow. It doesn't help them scale. Um, and so some of the provisions in particular um, say that uh, the data... Um, if it's developed here, let's say at Waterfront Toronto, um, then it can then it can quickly go back and then to the U.S. and then it, it's exposed to all sorts of privacy concerns and things like that. And so we we could have we could have sort of negotiated on this point, um, except we lost on it. Um, other things that impact data is uh, is the copyright uh, extension 50 to now 70 years after the death of the author. These things were just given away um, without much thought on the future of how this is going to be, this is going to impact Canadian businesses. So if, if we want to open up markets and we want to access markets, um, we're, we're, and we want to make our market more competitive um, for our, our, our domestic companies, don't increase the strength of um, IP here, given that we only, we only own 9, 10% of the IP here, um, because you're basically just increasing the rents that, it, it, that uh, foreign companies can, can charge to Canadian companies on our soil. So it's, um, we're doing, when it comes to, to trade and NAFTA, we've done the opposite of what we should have done. We should have um, resisted that as much as possible. You, uh, you mentioned Waterfront Toronto, which is like giving me a softball right down the middle of the plate. So I have to ask, um, in relation to Sidewalk Labs, um, uh, Dan Doctoroff, the CEO of Sidewalk Labs, will be speaking immediately after our panel. Um, I had a meeting yesterday with, uh, uh, with the chair of, of Waterfront Toronto, and uh, he... He indicated to me that this project really, you know, conceded at most that, that the data and privacy concerns that have been raised through this, uh, this polarizing pro project have actually been really important uh, to allow Canada to kind of wrestle with these things. And I'm, I'm curious, Joshua, you, you, you know, you, you've lived in this world for a while. Um, when we talk about, first, ethics is one thing, but certainly data privacy. How do we ensure that Canadians uh, have their privacy protected in this new era? And when the minister talks about, you know, Canada being the Switzerland of data, uh, how does that play when you have, uh, you know, uh, large big tech uh, companies coming in on in downtown Toronto? So there's a concept that I really like that has been discussed a lot recently called data trusts. Yep. And the idea here is to uh, have third parties uh, neutral third parties that are going to be operate on behalf and to protect the interests of uh, the public who are generating that data and be able to aggregate all of their strength in, in you know, one entity which can negotiate with companies, hospitals, um, and any entity which wants to take advantage of the data for, for good use and make sure the data is used according to uh, the values expressed and the wishes expressed by, by the, the people who are uh, making a deal with that data trust. So right now, there is no intermediary between uh, ordinary users, say, of Facebook or Google, and, and those companies that are using the data. And in legal terms, there is, there is, you know, there's no way like I can negotiate a different contract uh, as, a, as a single individual uh, in a way that's uh, you know, I'm more comfortable with in terms of privacy, in terms of how the data is going to be used and what it's going to be used for. But if we um, get together in a way 
and say we have uh, laws that say, well, uh, you have to choose a data trust. It doesn't have to be a, a public entity, but th there should be laws that say uh, companies should allow users to make sure that the contracts are negotiated on their behalf by a data trust, and, and then individual people can choose their data trust, like they choose their financial trust. Janet, you, uh, your organization came out with a, a proposal for the Sidewalk Labs project to have the data trusts um, be run out of the Toronto Public Library, I believe. Yep. Um, tell us a little bit about it's that. It's called Bibliotheque approach. in Montreal. No, um, the, uh, let, me, let me just say, this is not a sidewalk problem. This is a problem for autonomous vehicles. It's a problem for smart cities. It's a problem for City Hall because we haven't figured out what the rules are about sharing data that we're gathering between departments. So yes, we had uh, weighed into this saying, look, let's look at how do we solve for this. It's an important, critical piece to start moving forward with enablement. Our recommendation was Toronto Public Library. It's a trusted uh, third party organization. They work with data. They're pretty digitally savvy. And they would have the, I think, the trust and the ability to put in place an advisory group to, to put this kind of data trust in place. And it's doing all the things that you're suggesting it would. And it's just, again, trying to say, this is one more piece of a number of things that we need to solve for if we're going to allow our tech firms to innovate and operate here. Yeah, and so I, I, when it comes to the data trust of a number of colleagues at the Center for International Governance Innovation who've um, researched this well, and what I've seen on the Waterfront Project is a lot of hand waving and pointing, but none of the, um, none of the, there's no details on what this is going to be, whether it's a legal data trust and there's a trustee and a beneficiary and things like this. So at this point, I think um, uh, it, it doesn't make any sense for us to be saying that this, uh, what, what Waterfront Toronto is proposing is a data trust. I think it's a branding exercise. I think it's um, just sort of a lipstick on the, the, the front of this thing. But, but um, if I might interrupt, that's not what, uh, this, isn't this the feds and the province and the city that should be putting in place the operating framework? Waterfront is a development yeah, organization. So, 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 somebody's got to take a leadership role yeah. on, on what the data framework, the data frameworks need to be. With all due respect to the library, um, the, this is, we're talking about an innovation asset um, where, and, and, there's, and, the, and certainly privacy concerns. So I think we want to have somebody with some experience um, in doing that to, to, to helm it. Um, and when you look at it from the IP perspective, opening up this data is, going to, um, is not going to work. This is going to, this is going to fail from day one. Um, it's like giving jet fuel to a bunch of, um, uh, the, the only people with the jet is Google. We're, we're sitting here as Canadians. We'll be using this jet fuel and we'll be lighting a nice bonfire in the back, but we don't have the capability. We don't have the, the, the AI technology to be able to, to use this data. The only people that can use it are Google. They've got the, they've got the patents. They've got the, 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 the training data. They've got, they've got their additional data sets. They're, they have such an asymmetrical ability to commercialize this, and then we're coming in and saying, okay, now uh, you can open up some of this data and, and um, we're going to have any economic advantage. There's... I, I can't see it happening. Joshua, you know, you, you, you I, see the data sets. I disagree. So. so I don't think that Google has more advanced um, AI science than any of our leading AI labs here in Canada. And that means... Science, science, science yeah, is one thing, but commercialization is another. I'm talking about commercialization. Are they going to be able to monetize this from day one? Yes. Um, can we take our university researchers and have them study it and in 15 years do something with it? Maybe. Do they have any but, more but than our banks? Issue, it's not just sidewalks. They have absolutely this, a lot, this, absolutely this more same than their issue banks. applies to my vision trying to do work with the city of Toronto. I mean, we just don't have a framework for us to be able to operate uh, with our innovators here. And I, so I think I, I think there's heavy weight of attention on sidewalk as one possible example of a number of things that are going to create commercialization opportunities here. We've got to fix it across the whole. So, so this does speak to the, the fundamental governance challenges mm -hmm. that, that we're kind of stumbling into, it appears. Uh, you know, Barcelona is a, is a good example of a city that, that, that tried to have the foresight to think ahead on some of these issues. And, you know, they're, actually, they're trying to generate revenue by selling it, <laughs> selling the data that they get when, with the permission of citizens mm -hmm. when they choose to companies, to third parties. Um, from a governance perspective, what needs to happen to put in place the mechanisms that allow us to um, stop um, uh, tipping over our skis, trying to catch up to the pace of change? Yeah, I, and I think it needs to be a federal level uh, oversight that needs to happen with this. And again, I go back to the fact that we're too small a country to do a made in Canada only solution. I think we need to be creating 
a block of harmonized rules and regulations that will work for us, work for other smaller uh, countries that are part of our trading alliances. But the piece for me is I don't think it, I, I don't think we can bifurcate it across multiple levels of government. We've got enough hassles with legacy interprovincial trade barriers that we're also trying to get over to help companies scale in Canada that I really think it needs to be at a national level and driven as something that's defining the whole for Canada, but doing it in the context of other like-sized markets that we trust and do business with, so we're building scale in our approach. Joshua, I wanted to flip switching gears a little bit. Um, you know, we, we, when we talk about the tech optimism and the, the, the tech utopia, listening to those kids, uh, kids, uh, listen to me, listening to those students uh, from Ryerson uh, on the screen uh, and their awareness of, of how their data and how these companies are, are, are affecting their lives, that's very different to where we were three years ago, you know, pre-Cambridge Analytica. Uh, and, and I'm just curious, as someone who lives and breathes this, do you... Do you, what role do you think humanity plays in, in the tech? Is, it, is tech going to solve humanity's problems like tech utopianism has, has said, so that certainly Silicon Valley preached for a long time, or is humanity actually gonna save tech? <laughs> um, so, or are we all doomed to a so, world of so, robots? So there's this, um, this phrase that I really like that has caught in my mind. Um, the wisdom race. And so what it means is uh, we are developing science and technology and uh, the pace of that progress is increasing. It's having more and more impact in society. It's, it's, we are building tools, that's what humans are good at. And those tools are becoming more and more powerful. Um, it, which means we have to be wiser in how we use them. Otherwise, we're gonna hurt each other. Like, children playing with guns, right? And in a way, that's what I'm concerned about. And being wiser is more on the side of humanities, right? So how uh, do we organize society better? How do we build a, a more uh, just society that doesn't leave anyone behind who would be tempted to use those big guns to uh, hurt many other people? I think that uh, we, we can't think that we're gonna solve all the problems with technology. Uh, science is very important and uh, should be the basis of rational decisions for society. But uh, that's not just uh, you know, computer science. It's, it's all of the science, all of the efforts we're trying to do to understand how the world works, how humans uh, work with each other, and so on. And, and, and that's... Uh, much broader uh, area of knowledge than the one that, say, I'm studying and my, my, my friends are studying. Uh, Jim, uh, again, coming back to the beginning of this, you know, Canada is uh, one country in a very large ecosystem with a geopolitical battle taking place uh, right in front of us. Um, how do we, to live up to the minister's claim of being the Switzerland of data, how does Canada uh, play a role in, in, in some of these larger existential ethical questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in, in a, to, to, to be able to be a leader, we need to be sh sort of a small, um, small open economy. We need to be shrewd in how we act, um, and it comes down to data and IP um, and how we generate and retain these assets and, and ensure that Canadian companies can grow and scale globally. Um, and so there's, all, there's, a, there's a, a level of policy levers that we can pull, being a lot more sophisticated when it comes to trade agreements and not giving away our future economic opportunity around IP and data. Um, it comes with education. Um, I teach at Western. I teach an engineering class all about intellectual property as a, as a business asset. We need to be doing a lot more around that and how, how companies actually use innovation assets to commercialize and, and, and grow and scale. Um, and, and, and really, there's a lot of other levers like the, 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 the shred uh, mechanisms, ensuring that if IP and data are being generated with taxpayer money, they're allowed, um, it's, it's accessible to, um, to, to other Canadian companies. It's not used to be exclusive um, and to block other people out. And 
Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of policy levers that we can that we have and that we've been we've been thinking about and we've been discussing and I've researched what um, what other countries have done um, very shrewd co uh, countries that are have been very effective like South South Korea France um, the Scandinavian country countries Israel and so we can we can take the the lessons learned from these these other other places that are able to navigate the China and the and the U S. Um, but we can't do it if we're, th if, we're if we're trying to ap appease everybody and um, and and the majority of our uh, government's time is spent um, with 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 our next guest uh, um, negotiating the terms of the the waterfront deal. Janet, uh, I, I, st I started on an optimistic tone. We got a little dark there. Can you take us home with an optimistic tone about? Uh, Look, why, you know, if, if I'm starting a Canadian business today and I'm a startup, and mm -hmm. what, why keep your business in Canada? That's a damn good question. And so let me, the positive thing is we've got a moment that could be momentum, and I'm going to go, I apologize for being a broken record. Maybe that makes uh, for good communications. We've got to get commercialization happening in market here. We've got to fix all of these problems about how do you support the new economy, and we need to do it with urgency. There's such smart people on this panel and elsewhere, and I would just love to find a way to bring this all together to say, how do we figure this out for the benefit of commercialization in Canada first? Because that's the best way to keep ourselves relevant in the new economy. And I heard uh, Lisa Raitt just before talking about we need to bring everyone along. Well, we know that in the major tech centers around the world, for every single tech job created, there's five jobs in the service economy. So this is good news for, for us as a nation and us as an economy if we can get this figured out. But it's all about making this moment matter and making it one of momentum for us. The Public Policy Forum doesn't mess around. I have little smiley faces saying, please wrap up. So uh, for this wonderful panel, distinguished panel, thank you so much for your time, and thank you all for being here. Thank you.